coin here, and it's probably not doing anywhere near the work that I'm doing. And I'm not saying it was driven for financial gain, but it was also, I think, a bit was, hey, can I be financially secure to have my three children live in this detached house? And B, can I get a better work-life balance? And yeah, um, another thing I was going to touch on that was you've got like, like you said, you've gone into teaching. It's almost like this extra bureaucracy is it impacting your impact on the kids, right? Like I'm assuming if you're up to one marking and whatever, then your sessions aren't going to be as good as if you just had all, like hours yeah. to prepare and, and then be really up for it and deliver yeah. it at the best session you can. It, it was the levels of it. So you obviously you've, you've got your marking, you've got your planning. And, and back in the day, I think around the 2000. Six March 2005, 2006, um, Ofsted were obsessed with lesson plans and detailed lesson plans and how it linked in with your schemes of works. And so everything, it was madness. And there was, there was a very little common sense teaching going on. From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guest this episode is Chris Irwin, co-founder and director of Wellbeing Through Sports. Following successfully exiting two businesses under the Head Start brand, Chris took his passion for improving children's lives to launch Wellbeing Through Sports, aiming at connecting physical activity to wellbeing and mental health support for children. During the episode, we discuss Chris's career as a professional rugby league player and how he started and scaled the Ed Start brand to become an industry leader in alternative education and sports coaching. Chris opens up about his decision to move on and the acquisition process in detail. A great insight for those business owners thinking about planning for the future. We also talk about his vision for well-being through sport and how he's working collaboratively to increase the impact of the program. Enjoy the show. I'm delighted to welcome Chris Irwin, founder and director of Wellbeing Through Sport, to the show today. Welcome to the show, Chris. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. I'm good, thanks, mate. Yeah, we've we've had a good chat before we even started recording today, so loads to go through, and I think going to be a really good, insightful episode for all of our our listeners, but we always start back with kind of your, I guess, your sporting journey, so rugby's played a massive part in it. So can you remember kind of the first time you picked up a rugby ball, or what what was it like way back when you kind of get that bug? Well, it was... I didn't start playing rugby really until I was about 14. Um, the family was a big rugby family. And from the age, as far back as I remember, you know, as a three, four year old going to the Willows watching South Red Devils at their old stadium. So I was always kind of going to those games, but it was generally Sunday morning playing football for Bar Hill. And then so I was going to say, that's like, so you're my new fan, right? That, that's, yeah, I've been my yeah, new I was going to say, yeah, that's a great yeah, country, yeah. So I play footy on a on a Sunday morning, and then Sunday afternoon it was usually a trip down with the whole family to the Willows to watch the rugby. So as a kid, I'd into everything, play cricket at county level, football again county level, and I was a believe it or not, when I was a, a little bit thinner, I was quite quick, and what that's kind of what got me into to rugby really, and I think this, my speed kind of got me away with a lot. Because, uh, as I say, started with about 14. By the time I was 15, I'd signed pro at, at Wigan and I was oh, playing wow. England schoolboys. So, was that something, you know, the reason, I guess, the initial reason to start rugby at 14, obviously, a bit, a bit later than, yeah. than, than most, maybe. Was that something that was picked up? Like, were you scouted? Was it something in school? Someone had thought, oh, he, he should get down the cut, he should try out? Well, there was a chap called Don Preston who was a big, a legend in, in rugby league in Salford. He played for Swinton Lions and he was a school teacher at the local high school. And I think I was running the, in the Salford uh, Athletics Championships on the 100 metres. So I'm on the, the blocks of the 100 metres and Don walks past me and he's quite a big guy. And he goes, Irwin, I want you down training at Salford by Saturday at Buell Hill. I went, all right, sir. So that was it. Literally, that that was it. And that, I think that was a common uh, thing for Don to do, is just to turn up at these athletic events and intimidate kids to try rugby. But yeah, so that's the way it really... I mean, I, I think in my head, I, I knew I, was, I would be good at rugby. I played a bit at school and stuff, and all my brothers played. And uh, I, I kind of, in my head, I was going to play anyway. And, and Don came to me and was like, all right, yeah. Well, the Godfather's told me, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> so you must have mentioned school like that. Generally, someone as naturally talented as yourself generally enjoy school, right? Secondary school, normally have a really yeah, good time. Yeah. That's kind of the trend we, we hear. Is that what that's saying for yourself? Yeah, 100%. Um, really enjoyed it. I probably got the balance quite right in terms of the academics. I was, you know, I was a bit of a sport, sporty lad, so I enjoyed the banter and the feeling about and stuff. But generally with, with the teachers, I had a pretty good relationship with them. 
probably had a lot of very understanding teachers that kind of got me and enjoyed my company. So supported me with my education and, and my academics. So with GCSEs, I, I didn't do, probably do anywhere near as well as I could have done, but I did pretty well in them. Obviously from there, I'd gone pro at Wigan then. So I was at Wigan the following year. So I had to go down to a Wigan College and I did I did a BTEC there. So I, I shunned the A-levels just because it fitted in. The BTECs kind of fitted in with the training that we were doing. In terms of, um mentioned your brothers all played and stuff, so you definitely come from a, and, and obviously family used to go down and watch, watch Salford, so definitely a sporting family, right? Yeah, massive, yeah. So my dad, one of the early memories of my dad, he's playing rugby union at the, the De La Salle club. And then, you know, and, and then in the summers on the Saturday afternoons, we'd watch him play cricket at Swinton Moor side. And all my brothers, my, my eldest brother, he was a good, you know, athlete. He was a good middle distance runner then. I've got family of five. <laughs> so, you know, my brother Adam, he played pro rugby union for Coventry and Birmingham Solihull. Nick played professional footy for Bolton and Rochdale. And oh. I was the youngest of the bunch that went down the rugby league route. So do you, do you feel like being the youngest, you have like something to prove or a chip on your shoulder in terms of what your brother's achieving? Was that something that maybe, because we always talk about why people are so driven, especially entrepreneurs like yourself. Yeah. Is there something um, niggling in the back of your head to, probably. to kind of compete? I'd 100% said there's a chip on my shoulder, <laughs> uh, if you'd ask them. But no, I think you, you are driven. You're the youngest out here and you're always kind of, I remember I was playing kickabout in the back garden, you know, when you're doing keep you up 60 seconds away, you've got to kind of score on, on, a, on a volley after 60 seconds and that and, We'd always be competing against each other. We'd play knee rugby in the front room and uh, cause absolute havoc. And me being the youngest, there's 10 years between me and my eldest brother. So you've got to kind of step up a little bit uh, with the big boys. But I think when you see them them being successful, it drives you to one. Um, I remember my decision to, to sign pro rugby was, I was playing footy at Man City at the time. They weren't any, anywhere near as good as they are now. They were going back here 20 odd years. And... So I was at City and Wigan had offered me a deal. My brother, Nick, had just left Bolton to go to Rochdale because he'd been released from Bolton. And I thought, well, Nick's actually a better footy player than I am. Uh, and he's just been uh, been off by Bolton to go to Rochdale. So part of my decision to sign for Wigan at the time was like, well, if our Nick's not smashing it, I might have to try this uh, this overball <laughs> game and, and see how I'll go with that. Yeah, but that's uh, quite a mature decision at the time then, I guess, like looking at it and I guess with that foresight to say, yeah, because that, that's what I hear about all the time, now the number of kids who are going into into uh, academies and, and um, obviously not making it and stuff. So it's kind of... Yeah, it, it, it was. And I think, and you was good at rugby, you know, was, as I say, within a, in a years playing England school boys and with footy, I was just probably another one of those players on a, on, on a club's books yeah. other than playing South of Boys and with South America, with South of Manchester Boys when I was 15, I think. But that was as far as it got. And there was obviously far bigger levels than that. So I think in my head, seeing what happened with Nick and then actually seeing how quickly it progressed with the rugby, that was the way I was going to go. This would be the one for you. And then in terms of rugby then, so we got got into that. And you said you signed pro, was it 15? You said 15, 16? Signed, yeah, first deal at 15. And then obviously when I left school, I went straight into the academy at Wigan. And I spent five years there, like every kind of story of these players that go through the ranks, playing in the reserves probably three years at that time. I think the first reserve team game was about 16, 17. But the position I played, there was a, a guy called Chris Wadlinski, who was Great Britain fullback, and he was a legend. So it's like trying to get in, as a goalkeeper, trying to get into Man United when Peter Schmeichel's in goal. <laughs> so I think at the age of 20, just kind of went right. I had another two years of my deal at Wigan then, and I just went, it's just not going to happen. And I'm sitting there with the director of rugby and saying, look, it's got to be a tough decision as well. Yeah, it's got definitely got to be a tough decision knowing that, sort of like you said, Wigan and all the, and all the kind of the legacy and history that goes with Wigan, being a Wigan player versus yeah, well, playing every week for someone else. Maybe exactly. Like, yeah. It was an amazing club and everything that was there at Wigan was brilliant. And I loved it the whole time there. I absolutely loved, loved the people there and the way it was treated. And they did, they were understanding. They let me go and it was Lee Santorin's that came in for me and I went there the following year. And I was playing every week, so I was enjoying it. Um, it was a division below, so he kind of... Um, I wouldn't say professional. Well, it wasn't as professional. <laughs> the, well, the players weren't as professional, should I say. There was more of a drinking <laughs> culture there than there was at Wigan, put it that way. But a successful time, though. It, it, it was great. I enjoyed it. I loved it. And as I say, I'd continued playing. Broke my jaw twice in 2004. It was the year of my wedding, actually. Broke my first time, I thought, 2004. So if you look at all my wedding photos, it's not one where I'm smiling, doing the teeth, he smiles, all that. Oh. Because <laughs> my, my, my face was a mess. And then... 
2005, I broke it again. But that period in 2005, I'd already decided I'm going to go into teaching. So I started my teacher training. So I made that transition in my head there. The rugby's probably going as far as it can. I had two young kids at the time. I won another career and spent two years at uni doing my uh, teacher training. Were you doing that in line, like along the same time as playing? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Right, so yeah. I was doing it at the same time. So I was, I kind of cut my teeth a little bit when I was at Lee. I spent a bit of time at a local school when I was out of training and I enjoyed it there, actually. I think that's what kind of, oh, this might be a career for me later down, further down the line. Two years later, I was like, right, this is what I want to do. This time, yeah. So I went to, um, it was Oldham, my next club from there, and started my teacher training then. And when I finished my career, I was at Swinton. 2006, I qualified as a teacher. Um, and went, right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a PE teacher. Um, and that, that was the transition, really. Great. And is that, um, so that secondary school, secondary school PE? Yeah. So you've gone into that role. Obviously, I'm interested in, are you transitioned into launching your own your own business with Edstar, et cetera? But was it a case of was it what you expected it to be? Like going in full time and like right now I'm the, I'm the P teacher. Was there anything that was kind of I, think, so I guess I'm thinking of like what's the origin? So why would you step away? Why, 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 why move away like, from it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Expectations was similar uh, yeah. to what I kind, of, kind of knew what I was kind of going into. I think the level of bureaucracy in education threw me a little bit in terms yeah. of having all your paperwork up to date and done to the extent that was expected it, what it was expected to be done at, the level of what you were actually delivering and how much PE you were delivering and how many other curriculum areas were, you were expected to deliver as well. So it was kind of then, it was like, right, well, I'm not enjoying it. I remember sitting in my front room with a colleague. We were marking just vast amounts of BTECs. We were doing <laughs> these folders and the portfolio of kids' work and, I'd literally, a colleague came around, he was working with me on these on these programmes. He spent the Saturday with me. I'd done it all day Friday and Friday evening. I was up till about one on the Saturday and I was doing the same on the Sunday. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> you know, what, I've got a young family. Do I want this for the rest of my life? And at the time, my brother who was teaching, he'd been asked the guy I can't say his name actually is that it was a football coaching company local to us um, and a guy who would had been doing this for 15 years or so and he'd been asking Nick to come and help him doing these summer clubs and, uh, and Nick was like Chris he's still he's, he's got loads of clubs going on and I said how much do you reckon he's making and um, we had this conversation and he kind of throw a load of figures in the air and multiple by how many kids are probably going to his clubs oh, he's making a decent Kind of, and it's probably not doing anywhere near the work that I'm doing. And I'm not saying it was driven for financial gain, but it was also, I think, a bit of it was, hey, can I be financially secure to have my three children live in this detached house? And B, can I get a better work life balance? And yeah, um, another thing I was going to touch on that was you've got like, like you said, you've gone into teaching. It's almost like this extra bureaucracy is it impacting your impact on the kids, right? Like, I'm assuming if you're up to one marking and whatever, then your sessions aren't going to be as good as if you just had, like, hours yeah. to prepare and, and then be really up for it and deliver yeah. it at the best session you can. It, it was the levels of it. So, you obviously, you've, you've got your marking, you've got your planning. And, and back in the day, I think around the 2006, 2005, 2006, um, Ofsted were obsessed with lesson plans and detailed lesson plans and how it linked in with your schemes of works. And so everything... It was madness, and there was there was a very little common sense teaching going on. You literally had to, that was a plan you'd written, and if offset came in, you had to follow that that plan as it was. It wasn't seen as a working document that is seen now, where you're encouraged to adapt and, and encouraged to change and, and move with what's in front of you as long as you achieve those outcomes. So I was kind of hit with that, and I, I didn't like how rigid it had to be at the time. And then I think as well, you know, one of the reasons I retired a smashed my face in a couple of times, but b you know, weekends are out because we were playing. We could be playing anywhere across the country. And, you know, you'd gone on a Saturday and you're not going back till late Sunday evening. So, you know, you've got young families and you want to spend that time with them. And then you, you decide to make a decision to go into something where you think you can spend more time with them. And actually just marking. And it was frustrating. So I, I made that decision based on what this guy would be thought would be earning. Um and then when you actually go into it, you've got to graft a, a hell of a lot harder to build it. <laughs> and full respect to the guy, he was doing it with, you know, the old leather footballs that, that where the leather's actually falling off. So you just see, he was doing, you know, football check with those balls. It was just like 10 years old with no, you know, hardly any leather on it with 
traffic comes for goals went right you know what let's make this professional a little bit yeah definitely so we kind of built it from there and I thought initially that I'd get a load of work uh, doing football and rugby league the biggest income I got because I was a qualified PE teacher with schools going Chris can you do gymnastics yeah so I actually started um, a lot of work came from doing after school gymnastics clubs and to this day uh, I say that they were the best sessions I've ever done because I probably wasn't a specialist as gymnastics as it would be in rugby league or football but actually I prepped far better for all of those sessions and as kids were developing I had to adapt with them so I kept on going to this there was a, a gymnasium in Henley called in Henley Gymnastics so I'd go there a lot just to work with the coaches and see what they were doing to progress and how I could actually progress with these kids because it's great you know doing forward rolls and dish and art rolls and teddy bear rolls is, is easy to start with when you're seeing these kids then absolutely going well actually can we get the springboard out and can we do this and we can do that I was like yeah, okay. next, next week, let me plan first. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I'm curious yeah, on that one. Do you only started out? Because I think, um, so you initially, was it, was it branded as Ed Start at that, at that time? At, at the time, we were Sporting Start. Sporting so start. We, we, we started out as Sporting Start. Uh, and the reason Ed Start came about is I'm quite an ambitious guy. And I'd, um, I was working with an ex colleague of mine, his sister was a, a drama teacher. So I kind of got some word for her doing after school clubs under the sports and start umbrella. And then we, that went to Saturday morning clubs and holiday clubs. And then we started a school and bizarrely said, do you do any modern foreign languages? And I said, leave it with me. I'll, uh, I'll find some modern foreign language teachers. So then we started doing that as well. And, and quite as, quickly, I, just, I mean, as a brand, Ed Starts, I think it's brilliant in terms of, I guess when you probably when you looked at it, you probably thought someone might already have it. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, um, yeah. You know, at starting life, educational start, you know, yeah. that, that's where we kind of got it from. But I didn't want to deviate away from sports and start too much. And it was 2010, one of the high schools I previously worked in, they, they contacted me and said, look, Chris, can you come in and work? We know you're working for yourself now. Could you come in and work with these 12 tough individuals that they were struggling to deal with? And basically what they did at the time, they sent these individuals off site each day to a provider. They'd done a... They had a new principal of the school, so they went to see this provider and uh, they found these kids all sat in a pool room um, smoking things you probably shouldn't be smoking whilst in an educational facility. So they called me in, I think it was in November. I said, look, I don't do it. I said, the guy was called Pete Jones. I said, Pete, I don't do that kind of work anymore. It's all kind of primary school-based sports stuff. And he went, look, Chris, I could do with a massive favour off you. And, he, and he's basically... I'm not going to lie about it. Now he told me what this provider was charging. So I was like, okay, I can get cover for the work I was doing in the primary schools. I'll come and set this off. And what it was, we'd, we'd start with, with this group of kids. I'd converted the, the school where it was. They had they'd just become an academy. So they had the old building uh, whilst the new building was being built. And uh, I could converted the old boys changing rooms into a classroom oh, and I got these 12 kids to clear out the old sports hall so it was a functioning sports hall and we put them through a maths GCSE English GCSE and BTEC in public services and that that went like wildfire so this yeah. is where yeah. that then goes like that just goes two opposite ways so we had the, the sports section and then the educational section and doing them both whilst it was challenging we actually helped the growth of where we are to a point where I could sell it last year. Because they're, they're like complementing each other. I'm spot, I'm yeah, they, well, yeah. Or, or you're raising difficult. awareness of yourself. Yeah. yeah, they didn't necessarily complement each other because they're so different. Where it helped is that we're working across all of a sudden a load of secondary schools plus primary schools. Um, so because we were both branded as at start, the brand was so recognisable to most schools and heads across the Great Manchester region at the time. So this kind of special education where we're working with these challenging kids that started in that January 2010 by the July other schools wanted to get involved so we've got a venue in Withenshaw with 20 odd kids in there two years later we need to then get another venue in Salford then one in Berry, then one in Bolton when I sold it last year we became an independent specialist school so we're seen as a specialist as a school is that, where the, is that where the franchise I was going to ask in terms of for no, a, lot of, a lot of our, yeah. a lot of our um, obviously listeners are maybe thinking, or oh, they are franchising, or thinking of franchising, and there's kind of that that kind of, of you can franchise whenever, but generally some people might start and try and franchise immediately, or they might hit yeah. certain, which might be a mistake, some hit certain so, milestones. 
Yeah, on the special education side, that wasn't franchise. So that was just remain me. Okay. And I built a team. I think we probably had about on a left probably up to 50, 60 members of staff on that on, on, on that side across the various different um, facilities. On the sports side, as things were developing, we started, we were hitting lots more schools and I got a growing team. So I started putting people in management positions, but with the amount of turnover you get, there's a lack of, you know, to fund managers and to pay people what they need to be paid to keep them in your brand and your organisation was quite challenging. And I was quite against franchises initially because I heard some horror stories of you're only as good as your last franchisee and if a franchisee is poor and it goes against the brand then you know all of a sudden your reputation slides and I went to some I think it was you know a franchise association event in Manchester and a guy was chatting there and he said basically you make sure your franchise agreement is really really strong so if anybody goes away from the brand guidelines that you put in place then you can pull that franchise at any time, no matter how much they paid for it. If they go against what you've got in your in your agreement and your brand, then you can pull it away from them. And that's why you produce these massive operational manuals, which tells you how to answer the phone, what words to use when you answer the phone, how you dress in the morning, how you kind of basically go into a school and sign in, and everything that goes, everything you do in your day is done to a done to a certain kind of mythology. So that gave me a bit of confidence. And I had a guy that had been with us from college, from university. He's actually a kid at all, bizarrely. And he came through the, the doors. As, and I, when he came to an interview, I rec- recognised that name, Ashley Greenhouse. And, uh, and, he came out and I looked at him and went, I used to teach you. And he went, you did? And uh, I was like, wow, this is brilliant. And he interviewed really well. We gave him a chance and he got started working with us as uh, assistant sports coach. He just graduated and casual paid. And over time, he grew throughout the organisation. I think he was the first franchise we had probably about 2015, maybe. And we kind of go, right, OK, Ash, I want you to run this, this franchise in, in, in Rochdale and see how he can get on. And within six months, he's smashing it. Another one of our guys been with us for a long time, Adam. He came to me and went, "Can I have a franchise, Chris?" I said, "Yeah, but there's a cost to you." He, he was pr- he was proof of concept. <laughs> um, <laughs> Adam then bought Berry, and then from there, can't remember the next one, but we had another ex member of staff. Well, member of staff Steve, who started working in the sport, and then he went, well, "I want to work in in the school side." So he wanted to work with these with these kids. So he kind of went, he started with us about 2011, 2012, 13, he was working in the school side and he came back to us about 2016 saying, I want a franchise. He then went, he got the Bolton franchise. It just kind of grew from there and then we got ex-teachers that wanted franchises that were disillusioned, a bit like I was, that came in and it kind of grew from there. And it was really so you looking at, at the time, obviously, you've, as it's growing, was it, because it seems like it was, Inbound, essentially, like people are coming to you for a lot of the franchises. But did you yeah, ever, did. what did you scale to? But I know we were going to talk about kind of your exit and kind of yeah. position. So what was you scale into over that, I guess, five, six year period? Yeah, so we, we I think when I finished, we had about 11 areas, franchised areas. Yeah. And my plan was never to kind of, with the franchising, go nationwide straight away with it. It was always quite strategic. And I wanted to be in control. All right, so I'm really conscious of the brand. That's not control where I manage them all the time, but so I could oversee them and if there's that issues... Quality standards and keeping it. Exactly that. So we, I'd do all the quality assurance visits and it was only kind of 2018, 19, Ash and Adam, that were the two first franchisees. I said, right, well, we're in, we've now got all these franchisees. I can't do the QA across all of these. Plus, oversee these skills that I'm doing. I need you guys to step up. Is an opportunity to be um, area franchisors. So they would oversee five, six franchise, franchises each. So they started doing that kind of quality assurance stuff that I'd be doing and that's kind of support stuff, which then allowed me to drive the business forward and start networking. Uh, and that's at the time where I actually met up with Libby and Sheila, who I'm now partners with with Wellbeing Through Sport. I met them at a networking event and we kind of shared ideas of what we can do to merge mental health with physical health and that idea came about at that stage so, so yeah definitely want to get into well being through sport and everything but before we do I know everyone listening will be interested in kind of I guess your exit from Ed Star and whether they're listening whether they're listening now of a plan or they have built their business to sell or they want to keep it forever pass it down the line 
I guess, what was your experience of that process? And also, was it something you kind of always set out to say, right, I'm going to build scale to this point and then exit the business? Well, the plan was at some point I'd always kind of sell up and, and move on. I think for me always, when you start kind of losing your passion for something, you're probably taking it to as far as you can. So it was twofold. So within my organisation, I'd actually split the companies into two. So I had Head Start Specialist Education Limited and I had Head Start Sports Coaching Limited. With the special education, that grew to a beast where we had lots of schools and lots of pupils uh, and very big contracts. And I kind of got to the point, the guy that I was working with who was one of the directors, I gave him a 15% stake in the business because he was doing so much. And that was more as an incentive. He initially started as a head teacher in the skills, but as the skills grew, there was more people involved. And I always knew his ambition was to run that and to take that off my hands at, at that time. But I knew also we wouldn't have the capital because it was worth, you know, over a million quid. They wouldn't have the capital to buy it. But there was always dividends through the company each year of a decent amount of money. So we got to a point where I spoke to me and I said, look, what are the options here? Because I know this guy wants it. I know he's not got X amount in, in the bank account to buy it. And we had been approached by a couple of other national uh, organisations wanted to buy it from us. That didn't interest me because I've seen that in the past where a lot of the staff, and you probably can gather it, one of the big things for me is loyalty. You look after people and everything we're all about is growth. All our staff kind of agree with us. Is we always talk about organic growth and would usually take a lot of staff as, as graduates and we kind of upskill them as they work with us. Or ex-pupils, whatever you yeah. Ex-pupils, <laughs> It makes me feel very old now, especially that he's got two kids and all that. I suppose to me, he said, well, there's this way where you can ultimately sell it to over a period of time. So you'd sell the company now, but the agreement would be that he pays you through basically what's the surplus, the dividends in the company each year. And you right. agree. So we looked at what company was um, left over in the company, the profits of the company, and we go, well, we could pay this off over four years' time. And there is um, tax benefits to that as well. Um, I'm sure if anybody wanted to do that, they could look into it. Yeah, um, yeah. But so we did that. We did start special special education, and that was. And was that because you know when you said about the national uh, players who came in? Was that almost that you felt like maybe it just get swallowed up in there to be efficiency savings and the people would be getting layoffs would, or something like that, or just take uh, a different? Yeah. Direction? So the guy, the so he's my best friend, and what I didn't want to happen is that him just go, okay, well, we don't want you either. Yeah, yeah, so he'd been on this journey with me for 10 years and I thought there's no chance I'm going to sell it to a national organisation that as soon as I turn a corner, he's, he's out on a limb. Oh they, oh, they make his life horrible for three years. And also, when you get taken over by a national firm, they want, might sometimes bring their own people in and all those people you've nurtured for a few years and that you're, you're very close to, even though we had a big team, you'd, I'd like to think you kind of take the time to know and get to know everyone, whether it's a TA, whether it's a cleaner, whether it's a senior manager, you, you get to take the time to know them and know the families. So you've got that responsibility, I think. Um, and I think the right thing to do was to offer it to James because it, it worked so hard in it. It was his opportunity to take over from me. And it was a way that wasn't going to kill him financially to take over. So it, that worked really, really well. And that was the February just before COVID. <laughs> Poor guy. So that happened then. And then I think it was April last year with Ed Start Sports Coaching. I was obviously busy in a way with wellbeing through sport and kind of working on things with that with Libby and Sheila. And I actually went to uh, a recruiter. I said, I need a general manager for Ed Start Sports Coaching. Go and find the best person in the sector to, um, you know, and let's get work at a salary that they can oversee Ed Start Sports Coaching. So this guy was doing that and there was some just some good name, some really good names were coming forward and people that I know in, in the sector and I, and I work with quite closely now. And as we're doing it, Ash and Adam, the two first franchisees, they came knocking on the door. And, we want to do it, Chris. We want to be general managers. We'll do it together. I said, well, listen, I'm looking for national sales now. So we've, we've smashed the market in this region and need national sales. I said, I'm not sure sales is, is what you guys are great at the moment. In a few years' time, we can develop that. But then as the conversation went on, I just turned around to Adam. I said, well, look, Adam, what is it that you actually want? And he went, I'll be honest with you, Chris, I want to buy you out. And how much do you think it's worth? And then he goes, I don't know. I said, all right, look. I said, are you just saying that flippantly? He goes, no. I said, he goes, I want to be in charge of this company. I love the company. He goes, I'm not trying to kick you out. 
I said, I know you're not, and I know where this is coming from. I know it's coming from a good place. I have been thinking for a bit, I might be starting to look to move on, and the reality I was. So anyway, I spoke to my accountant again. I said, what's the value? And he kind of come up with a figure. I went and met with Adam and Ash. There's the figure. What do you think? And they chewed my arm off. So I was thinking I should have added another zero on that. No. But um, the, the reason why it was because these two people have grown within the company. And again, there's that kind of loyalty and that opportunity for them to move forward. You know, I guess I'm not a martyr. You know, I've got what I want from it. I've, I've spent 15 years of developing and growing the firm. Um, and it was a nice exit for me, knowing I'm leaving it with, with two people that have grafted for 10 years, maybe even longer than that, to, to help the company grow. Um, and and so it's, natural- it's kind of, they've been with you that long, but they've also got that fresh energy now to like kick on and-, and Yeah, that, exactly kind of that. Lisa yeah. Life, yeah. And, you know, and I speak with them weekly, you know, still, and I love what they're doing. Um, they're recruiting more franchisees, they're driving it forward, and they've got that kind of passion to drive it forward. I think I touched on the passion side before. Once you kind of hit that point where I'm losing, losing that passion and that drive, that's the time to, to look to be moving things on, I think. And seeing their kind of enthusiasm and their passion and their focus to drive it forward, it's like watching your child grow and get married and then start really smashing it in life whilst you're kind of retiring at the same time. <laughs> it's that kind of fulfilment of that, which is great to see. And I don't think you'll get that by selling just to any random big organisation. So I think... No. In, in principle, I'm quite happy with the way Definitely that's Definitely not. I, pre- I appreciate it being so um, transparent with us. And I'm getting, I guess, a little segue into what you're doing with wellbeing through sport. And I guess it'd be good to touch on how that kind of developed with Libby and Sheila. And I suppose, I'm guessing, Ed Stout was probably your first customer, right? You had, well, at least you sold it to you got two customers ready to, yeah, to go Yeah, so we were able to trial the product through Ed Stout, yeah. <laughs> So again, you said you bumped into like a, net, was it a networking thing where you all met. Yeah, together? well, it wasn't quite a network. I think it was a. I met a guy who he said, "Oh, these these ladies, these two psychiatrists that had a company called Team Mental Health. Uh, you should go meet them, Chris." So I was like, "Okay." And you got these meetings. You never really quite know what you're going to get out of it. And but I'm sharing with them. And actually, really, it was Libby I met first, and she was great. I really got on with her, and she was saying that at the time she was going into schools to try and do CPD training for uh, school staff and she was struggling to get into these schools and has touched on early doors how hard if you've not got those kind of relationships how hard it is to kind of market into schools and, and get their attention so I think it was a little bit that when I was going in selling at start that I could maybe sell some of their team mental health stuff off and then as if I was a chatting with them she was talking about these kind of 12 core life skills that Libby used to work in the prison service with yeah, you know, adults with psychosis and real tough mental health issues. Sheila worked in CAMS, so she'd be working with any any child from anxiety to eating disorders to, to whatever. And both basically what they, they both say is that when you're dealing with these people, that be a 30-year-old bloke with psychosis or an 11-year-old child with an eating disorder, when you're just medicating, the, the person becomes a shell of themselves. And actually what they're lacking is the emotional skills and the social skills to actually deal with the issues that they face. And they bring it down to these 12 core life skills and it's things like conflict resolution, stress management, empathy, assertiveness. And they're saying if they're lacking two or three of these areas and life throws a curveball at you, which inevitably does, if you don't have those core life skills to deal with it, that's where mental health issues rear its head. So I kind of left this meeting and I just said to Libby, just it dropped it. I said, would you mind sharing these 12 core life skills? And they... I think they've been probably been um, they've been caught out a couple of times so they said you can do but you need to sign this non-disclosure form so I can't nick them so I was like that's fine uh, so I sent it and I said leave this with me for a couple of weeks and I started looking at can I deliver these sessions through PE so like first one was looking at emotional awareness so one of the things is children sometimes don't know how to say I feel happy I identify what emotion feels so I feel happy I feel sad I feel angry I feel disgust and then, then to then go, because of this reason. So we try to teach kids say, I feel this emotion because of this trigger. So I started messing around with these lesson plans. And I looked at emotional awareness. And I was like, well, why don't we just put a game of dodgeball, a game of unihawk, and a game of bench ball, right? Before they start the game, you get a kid to sign next to an emoji that reflects their feeling. So they go, right, okay. So you get a kid who's doing dodgeball, and they, they feel like um, fear. 
Why, why do you feel fear? Because I'm scared of being hit in the face by the dodgeball. And you could have a kid playing, you know, I feel happy. Why? Because it's my favourite sport. I love it. So you get them to play these games. And then seven minutes into the game, you stop the game. Go and stand next to an emoji that reflects how you felt during the game. And all of a sudden, you get these different kind of emotions. So a kid might go, I feel sad. Well, why do you feel sad? Because nobody passed me the ball. Um, I feel disgust. Why do you feel disgust? Because he cheated and he, you know, he kicked the ball with his foot or whatever, you know. So you, you ultimately create all these scenarios from these basic games and you're not coaching any technique. You're just bringing out these kind of core life skills and conflict resolution is a great one because you, have you done the game domes and dishes? Yeah. You've got a load of cones in the air, you set, set the kids, one team over there, one team over there. One team's got to turn the, the dome to a dish or the team dish to a dome. Every time you do it, you blow the whistle, go back to your sides, what do the kids do when they're walking back? Yeah, flip a, flip, flip, yeah, flip a couple over, right? Flip, flip them over, so the kids are kicking off with each other. Oh, that's not fair, they're cheating. So you say, okay, well, what can we do? What can we do to stop this? And it's like, okay, well, the kids make the rules and usually it's hand on your head when the whistle blows. The next time you do it, you'll get a kid just stood next to the same cone, not moving. And as soon as that cone flicks, he flicks it back and then the kids kick off again. So there's, there's another scenario. What rules can we implement? The kids create the rules. So by the time, third, fourth time you're doing it, there's no conflict. And, and we do the same with these rub the nest as well, which is another game for conflict resolution. So there are all these kind of games that you, you create. And basically what you do is create scenarios that brings out these core life skills. The so beauty is it then, you then take it into the classroom with these reflection tasks and the kids, it could be through discussion, it could be kind of answering some questions on these reflections. So it brings that learning home, it embeds that learning into them. Um, and within, when schools buy into the programme, they'll have a poster with all the core life skills in their classroom because... All of these issues will be going on all of the time. So, you know, a kid might be crying, another kid might be taking the mickey out of him. The teacher goes, what life skill you learned last week or two weeks ago? Empathy. Are you being, are you being very empathetic to that child over there who's clearly very upset? So then that, it gets that buy-in then for the whole school uh, lifetime of that, of that school. So it's not just that one hour a day. It's also, you know, something that get, engages the class teacher to go, well, you were learning about conflict resolution. You were learning about empathy or assertiveness last week. You need to be, you know, be doing it all of the time and embed it into everyday life and with a whole school approach. You know, at that time when you um, obviously took it away and I'd look at the, the skills and, like you said, it feels really kind of organic. It's embedded into PE and it could, could go right, like, like for yourself. You could see the potential of it. At that moment... I guess, how would this normally be taught in school, in primary school? Is there, is it just left up to the teacher to, to come up with, is there a set curriculum for, like, I guess for our listeners to, to understand what the landscape looks like outside of your, uh, like the Wellbeing Through Sport programme? Yeah, so we, we're obviously speaking to a lot of schools all of the time at the moment because there's a massive increase in mental health issues in schools. That's what I was going to say, like, they, the schools are at, like the hub of having to deal with a lot more than just the, <laughs> just academics and, and stuff. So, yeah. But, yeah. So I think one of the issues we, and this is probably Libya's and Sheila's biggest frustration. When they were training as doctors, it was always about prevention of physical health, but there was never that kind of prevention of mental health issues. It was almost kind of dealing with it once mental health issues arise, and mental ill health issues arise, should I say. So they're really keen on prevention and promotion of good mental health, as you would do with good physical health. So there's not much going on in skills around that. I think there's starting to be a movement towards actually nipping it in the bud in the early years of school. So I think there's a 10-year gap between when a mental health arises its head, so say a 15-year-old child, is 10 years before that they could be prevented with intervention and actually developing these core life skills and everything else that comes with it. So it's now a case of educating the school leaders to say, this is what we should be doing. There's a massive focus in schools on data-driven subjects, you know, SATs and maths and English and science. But what are we actually trying to do? You know, if, if a kid... Someone mentioned, I was at the UK Active Conference last week and it was really good points from me. You know, if a kid is struggling to breathe, well, what's the point of having a, you know, a qualification in English and maths? You know, fundamentally, you need better breathe, you need better walk, you need to be able to do all these things. If we're not actually teaching children about these core life skills, they're so useful in everyday uh, aspects of our lives, whether that's in leadership, whether that's in sport, whether that's just the way you and I communicate now, that needs to be delivered. You know, and are you going to be able to learn if you're dealing with mental health issues. Well, you're not. So the view of wellbeing through sport, it links to the P curriculum beautifully. It covers the RSE curriculum. It covers the PSHE curriculum. So you, you're covering three curriculum areas there, which should then create more time on the timetable and in the curriculum for 
skills to focus on other areas. Yeah, that, for me as well, in the sector, it's like the synergies is there in terms of everyone, all the providers uh, listening to this and all the ones we know um, in our networks, they're, they're all about fundamentals. Right? We're coming in that, that kind of primary school, first experience of physical activity and sport, and you're giving them all the fundamentals to then be active adults because you've taught them the, the core yeah. skills. Like with the life skills, it's going to help. We're going to stand them up to to manage their um, their mental health challenges that they're going to have throughout their life, like you said. So yeah, ex- exactly that. And, and and sports are a great arena to do that because you know you you know James would play sport. The call the life skills that you develop from it, you might not even realise. <laughs> but what you are doing, you're pulling it out. So these and then you're, you're teaching kids some like the emotional language that they, and, and the emotional literacy they need to know about was like empathy, assertiveness. Conflict resolution. You know, they just, oh, he was just angry. Well, why was he angry? What is the reason for that? They, well, that's actually conflict resolution. Yet someone's got angry, they were annoyed about something, you've resolved that issue. That's conflict resolution. So there are all these key kind of emotional <laughs> emotional language that kids <laughs> learn at that stage because they know about it. They're more likely to actually utilize those skills because they know what it actually means and the impact of it. So by putting it into the curriculum, you know, from five year old and above. It's fantastic for the kids and it's, it, you know, it does, and we're seeing it already, the impact it's having is, is, is huge. I know, um, in terms of the, the programme, it sounds like a perfect fit, but in terms of that rollout, that offer, I guess from a business perspective or kind of partnerships and getting that rolled out across across the nation and, and further, how, how are you looking to do that? Are you partnering with, obviously, your extensive network with, with Edstar, yeah. et cetera, but are you looking, I know we spoke before we started recording about trying to find those really high quality partners and obviously we might have a few listening now so how, how do they go about if someone's hearing and thinking I want to get involved in that whether it's at my school or with my business organisation yeah so there's it? two ways schools can buy it directly from us within that they get with the DFE last year announced that they wanted to have senior mental health leads in every school and with that somebody within who's that senior mental health lead would need to do qualification for it so we do the online training and it's DFE approved senior mental health lead training through our website. So we're one of the approved providers. There's only 60 across the UK and we're one of them with DFE. So schools can buy that directly from us. And then what we then try to do is kind of, to engage schools quite difficult. I touched on this before. So we want the best providers across the UK that have the license and the exclusivity in their area to deliver the products into those schools. They're the guys with the relationships with the schools. So they can upscale their products and delivery time and also they're upselling our products at the same time as well because they've got the relationships. And because it's so unique, their, their competitors wouldn't have this kind of a programme. So there's benefits, to massive benefits to those providers that have got the licence, but then it helps our business model grow as well. So, yeah, if anyone's listening out there and, and they're keen to have a Wellbeing Through Sport licence to deliver exclusive in their area, um, just drop me a, an email. It's chris at wellbeingthroughsport.co.uk. Definitely, yeah. And we'll, we'll, put, we'll link everything in the show notes as well if anyone wants to link through and, and set up a set up a yeah, initial connection with you. I'm really interested, I know being respectful of your time as well, but I'm interested in terms of loads of experience in terms of leadership, obviously sport, pro sport, growing a business, building teams exiting a business, launching another one. Have you kind of created any approaches to, to business for yourself? Like, like your, I guess your mantras or your kind of, your core values when you're talking about business and, and leading organisation? In the sense of what, James? What are you... In terms of like, if you're approaching, right, if you, when you're building a team, what do you look for? Is there a way that okay. you approach developing and like you're obviously scaling this business now? Is there a way that you kind of approach it? Yeah, I think the approach to most things in life is A, having the right people on board. It's, it's having that kind of focus on quality, what your USBs are. And then it's how do you grow that and how do you nurture it? And I guess it's having the right people around you all of the time yeah. because you can't do it all yourself. And I think that's the, the biggest fault that a lot of people try. And I've done it many times. Like I do it all myself and you can't, you don't have the time to do it. And that's when you start seeing the, all these plates that you're spinning fall down. So it's getting those really good people around you that you know, that you trust and that you can rely on. Mm. Once you've got those fundamentals in place, you can start growing your business then because they can start taking a lot more responsibility off your shoulders as well. Definitely. You said there about kind of juggling everything and obviously you've been speaking about mental health. Is there anything that you put in place to to keep yourself like de-stress, manage all of the expectations on you or the ones you put on yourself? Anything you kind of always have in your routine or you do regularly to to maintain like peak performance? I do. So I'm a chairman of a local, my local rugby league club, which you, you could say probably adds, adds more stress. Yeah, a little bit more, yeah. um, But actually, I used to coach all these kids, all the teams from throughout the club and I'm chairman there now but actually when I go there it's a passion and I love it um, I'm also head of youth at Solve Red Devils which is something again it's a paid for role but 
very small kind of pay. But it, it sounds mad. That's actually quite therapeutic for me to do those things because I love it. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing those things that my passion is rugby league. I love rugby league. Um, I love the people that are involved, you know, at Sovereigns as a professional club, but also my, my outlaw amateur club, the Roosters. I guess that is it. And I'm probably there most evenings there. And, and my kids are, you know, my youngest is 15, my eldest is 22. You know, hanging out with family, that's great. I try and go to the gym and I get a routine into that, but I'm uh, probably not as dedicated as I should be with that. Um, I did do a bike ride three weeks ago, just come back from the States. We did a 560-mile bike ride from Niagara Falls to New York, which was pretty cool. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, just a small uh, so one. I, wasn't able, I wasn't able to walk for the first week when I got back. Uh, we did that in six days. But that was for a charity. It was for Ugly Cares, which it was just incredible. It was an amazing journey. It was horrendous at times in terms of the pain I was going through completing it. But again, you're doing it with a lot of good people and you're sharing it time with a lot of really good people that are positive to, to your mindset definitely yeah, and it's that thing where you're doing something that you that you love like you said playing coaching you almost can't think about anything else in that moment can you so it's giving you like an hour where you're just switching off from every yeah. all over normal you're switching off of those the stuff in your business aren't you yeah. and it, you know you might say it's more stressy from other things but actually you've been able to switch off for those kind of hour or so and getting at something else that you're passionate about and they actually love doing Chris Last question for me. We always have this question, which is to reflect on if you could go back in time and speak to uh, young Chris before he got started in his kind of uh, his journey as an adult, you know, when you left school, etc. Is there any one piece of advice you'd go back and and give yourself? Maybe I don't know. Maybe giving it to your kids now. But yeah, you go back and tell yourself. Yeah, patience. Just be patient. Things come. I guess it was a bit more patient at Wigan. I might have been playing more first team games there, uh, but that's with everything. You know, you, these times, especially when you're in. A- business you're like it's not coming going the way especially in the early doors it's not coming quick enough sometimes you just gotta be patient ride out the storms and if you're passionate about it enough you care about it enough there's a good chance you'll become successful off the back of it so just be patient with it brilliant Chris thanks so much for giving up all your time for us today and being so transparent mate really enjoyed it my pleasure great speech to you James thank you for listening to this week's show you can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts if you'd like to get in touch with us you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports, or on my account at james underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport.